So yes, I'm going to be talking about the technological singular. Thanks for coming everybody, I appreciate you getting up early on this nice uh, gloomy Saturday morning. It's a great day to have a conference, but right now, like what I was discussed before, we are in a period of rapid accelerating change. There are technologies all around us and, it's, and it has historically created a major transformation. That's an example of a transformation, this is like a bomb going on. That wouldn't have happened if the idea didn't pop out of somebody's mind, okay? So, there are some examples of technology all around us. Where did you wake up this morning? Did you wake up in a bed? Did you wake up next to a clock? Or did you have four walls around you? 10 to 12, 15,000 years ago, we were running around the spheres trying to catch animals to survive. Now we're going to work and we're sitting at computers. Okay? So, a lot of our job today is actually interfacing with technology in order to survive. So mid-machine intelligence does um, pose a number of complicated problems that I think are right for analysis now. And now, rather than later, because, it's very important because intelligence is powerful. Okay? So the mobile phones that you have in your hand didn't grow on a tree. Neither did they grow on the ground. They didn't fall from the sky. God didn't give, us to it, give them to us. They actually came out of, out of ideas that sprung out of the human mind. So, this is the first time I've done a video presentation for it. It's going to be a bit choppy. Um, yeah, so I, I suggest that we do have a clearer understanding of the, of the likelihood of technology to um, benefit us or to harm us. So, in order to understand the singularity, we need to think about um, elements of the singularity clearly. And so instead of me just sitting here trying to tell you what I believe is important, I want you to be able to make up your own minds about the feasibility of the technology, where it's, whether it's possible, or whether we're all just loonies, feeding your, like, the same oil. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, present to you ways to think about technological change, especially artificial intelligence, because I believe that artificial intelligence is going to be the most powerful intelligence in general, is the most powerful force we know in the universe. So we're going to change that quickly. We've got an example here. This is just an animation of um, animals in body parts, body designs that exploded. The, the, in the Cambrian explosion, uh, there was, this is like, four billion years ago, there were so many new body designs just crop up out of nowhere in relatively no time at all, in geological time frames. So we're not talking about like five minutes here. They took like millions of years to develop different body plans, okay? But those body plans that they that, that suddenly just appeared on Earth within a couple of billion years, a few million years, or tens of million years, I'm not really sure, but it, it was a very short period of time compared to the billions of years that the universe has been around and the 4.3 billion years that Earth has been around for. Um, and so we can see these body designs, I think there are about 18, right? We can see them in modern life forms. Here we can see an elephant, which is based on a very early body design that came about in the Cambrian explosion. Okay, so the point is that change can happen very quickly rather relative to um, other change happening at the time. So one of the other interesting things about um, evolution of the species is that certain forms of, of um, evolution happened in many different branches of the phylogenetic tree. So that means that many branches of evolution converge on interesting body designs, like the wings of a bat, okay, and the wings of a bird. They're very functionally similar, okay, um, but they, when, when they diverged early on in evolution, they didn't have wings, but both of them developed wings, okay. So the idea here is that evolution seems to converge on powerful body plans and powerful ideas. And another one is intelligence. Um, and we believe that we've, uh, scientists believe that they found general intelligence 
in other forms of life that are so far divergent from human life, like Corbis, uh, Parrots, they have a certain form of general intelligence. Remember before, I talked about how general intelligence can work across different, um, uh, like you can have intelligence across different areas um, that cross-pollinate each other. So you can have intelligence in like socialization and you can have intelligence in um, a subcategory, maybe that might be the ability to influence people, the ability to speak. These all affect each other. But then you might have a form of intelligence that um, is really good for you to be able to kick a ball. And from that, um, it will make it easier, learn, easier to learn how to, um, sorry? I've got 25 minutes left. It will be easier to learn how to uh, kick a football rather than a soccer ball, although they're completely different objects. And then you might be able to learn how to play billiards better, because you understand how balls roll, okay? So, intelligence has evolved in primates, and they've evolved in other species as well. So, from this point, what I'd like to say is, evolution has found intelligence important. Um, and another, another interesting fact is that evolution has found intelligence so important that humans, um, I guess maybe 10,000 years ago, just as agriculture started, I mean we have record fame that up to 40% of women die during pregnancy, okay, during, during giving birth. And that's a shocking thing, but it's interesting that evolution found it so important to um, have intelligence that it made intelligence so important in humans that it was willing to allow for women to die. In 40%, up to 40% um, of women to uh, die in childbirth. That's a, that's a pretty high number. Um, and so, so the, intel so the accelerating progress in technology has been uh, a central feature of the past. Um, not only this century, I've put this century because we've been around to witness some of the amazing technological changes. So, everybody knows where this thing has come from. Has anybody recognised where it's come from? Okay, yes, I see a couple of hands. So it's, yes, yep, yep, that's right. It's from the 2001 Space Odyssey, you're, uh, you're correct. I said Odyssey, sorry, I meant Odyssey. Um, so it's a very powerful scene and it shows how um, earlier primates that maybe were descended from us learned to pick up objects and use them as tools. And there's an interesting transition coming up we'll soon. If you haven't seen the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, I recommend you see it. It's a great movie. So, here's a quote from Bernard Vinci, who actually coined the term technological singularity. He thinks that we're on the edge of the um, uh, rise of change comparable to the rise of human life on Earth. Okay? So, another reason why I've, why I've um, sort of talked about the Paleo explosion and monkeys picking up objects and starting to use them and animals using our technology to achieve amazing things is because we may be seeing that again with our own technology. We may be seeing such explosive change um, that it, even by today's standards it, it may actually really surprise us. Um, within our lifetimes alone, what sorts of technologies have we seen just come out of nowhere it seems? It didn't come out of nowhere actually. Um, it came out of minds, this technology. We've seen the internet, we've seen mobile phones, we've seen, um, we've seen all sorts of new forms of media come out there. We've seen uh, search engines get better and better, social uh, networking sites that are putting people together. Now we understand, now, now we can see what's going on, the other side of the world, almost in real time. So Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, but the ones most responsive to change. Okay? Now, Charles Darwin, I'm sure most of you know, uh, came up, was one of the first people to come up with the, the idea of evolution. Okay? Now, why does that matter? Us as humans didn't rise from the animal kingdom because we were strong. We don't have massive muscles. At least I don't. I know a couple, a couple of people in the audience there have really big muscles and they like to flex them very often in front of the mirror. Um, so the idea is that we didn't 
rise to prominence of human species by being strong, by flying. We weren't great flyers, in fact, we didn't fly. Um, we weren't really good fighters. We've got very big mouths. We don't have massive teeth. We don't have claws. We, we, we can't dig very well. Okay? But what we can do is innovate and invent. So here's the transition I was talking about. He just threw us all up into the air and suddenly it becomes a spaceship. Well, that's awesome. So we have to ask ourselves, in the near term horizon, what is going to change with technology? Is it, or have we just seen all the change, uh, technological change that we, we can expect within the next uh, you know, 20 years? I doubt it. Technology is, is moving ahead like gangbusters. There's every reason to believe that there are some very powerful technologies that are almost at a tipping point, ready to make a big change in the near future. So, what do I mean by tipping point? Okay, so we, if we leverage something, um, up until a certain point, we only need to push it a little bit further, and gravity takes it down the rest of the way. So, it'll become easier and easier to do certain technologies once the invention of preparatory or foundational technologies allow us. So, it's kind of like grabbing all the the low hanging fruit from the lower parts of the branches of the tree and then building a ladder, a technology, to be able to easily pick fruit high up the tree. So, I think that we can expect to see technological change. I think it's fair enough to um, assume that there's some likelihood of uh, powerful technological change in the future. And so, but it just Technology just doesn't happen by itself. It's not going to actually create itself yet. Although we do have um, robots that are particularly good at um, science. There's a robot called Adam. That's my name. I'm not a robot, but there is actually a robot called Adam that does its own science. That has um, discovered it's like a. Uh, it's discovered how I think yeast uh, grows in a certain environment. And then also, um, there's another program called Eureka, another bit of artificial intelligence there. It's amazing because what it does is it, it can um, watch uh, chaotic pendulum swing. You know the pendulums that have like a more than, like you, it's got one straight bit and then a hinge so that there's another bit which is swinging underneath that. So it's got kind of like a, like a double jointed pendulum. Eureka watched the pendulum swing, and from that derived the mathematics to an approximation of Newton's laws of gravity. As far as my interpretation, um, I'm not a, like a scientist in that area, so I'm sure people might um, tell me that I've sort of made you know, sort of explain that as well. Who knows? Okay. So every great advance and the benefit in science is issues of an audacity of imagination. So what we really need is courage and imagination to be able to develop ways that we can navigate the technological terrain in the future so as to come to beneficial ends. We don't want a, a society tomorrow where technology doesn't need us and therefore we, we are discovered we may not have employment. Or we to survive. So, um, I, I just think it's amazing how far we've come within uh, my lifetime. What the sort of technological change that I've seen. Uh, the computers started to get popular when I was a kid. I had an Apple IIc on my desk and I learned how to program basic then, um, which was a you know, pretty good leg, leg up into the IT industry that I picked up later in my life. So, we can see that there's been massive change. So is super intelligence plausible? And I asked this question before, but I really do want you to make up your own minds about that. Um, I, I don't think I can convince you. I think you need to uh, be able to convince yourselves. But there are ways to think about um, super intelligence. And what do I mean by super intelligence? Well, an intelligence that is greater than the standard of human intelligence we see. So there are, there are prominent neuroscientists and, and um, CTOs of companies who have 
suggested that there's something like a technological singularity on the horizon. Here's two of them. Is there any neuroscientists in the audience? No? Anybody studying neuroscience as a secondary subject? Okay, Ben. Yes, we have one. Okay, so maybe you can uh, back this up later. But um, so Terry Stanowski, who also spoke at Singularity Summit in America and came to Australia and, and spoke uh, as well, said that reverse engineering the brain is within reach. So we are developing the technology now to be able to scan and, and understand how the brain works on a finer and finer level. We're developing more and more um, robust technology to be able to understand what's really going on biologically in our head. And if we understand what's going on in our head enough to understand what the underpinnings of intelligence is, then it, it becomes largely an engineering problem. It's not a mystical problem. It's not a, a problem that's so far removed from, from where we are today. It's, it's, it's not in a different magisterium. I argue that our intelligence is solely based on physical processes in the human brain. It's all physics. And so, yeah, CTO, Justin Ratner, the Chief Technology Officer of Intel, is saying that we'll make steady progress towards uh, Ray Kurzweil, who you might have heard of, his version of Singularity. So, but I, I'll echo this again. There's a tension between creativity and skepticism, this is quote by Carl Sagan, that has produced the stunning and unexpected findings of science. We need to be skeptical about these concepts. I mean, we should just blindly um, accept that AI one day will just suddenly spring out of nowhere and um, change the way we understand, or make, make, make a big change. I, we need to look at this carefully and in understanding the likely roadmaps to artificial general intelligence may help us bias the likelihood of making it safe. Okay. So by accelerators here, I mean what occurrences, what, what sorts of developments in the future will likely uh, make the singularity closer? What, what will speed up the coming of something like the singularity? More hardware, okay? So more computing power allow us to uh, do more and more calculations per second. That will allow the main list to do amazing things. So the faster and faster we run, even our current algorithms, uh, the more likely we're going to get there further. But that's not the only thing, okay? So best algorithm design. We don't know. Maybe we have the wrong algorithms right now, and just having speed won't cut it. Maybe we need to design better algorithms to be able to do this, and maybe more efficient algorithms. Because maybe if we depend on uh, Moore's law data, uh, perhaps that it'll take ages to catch up. So massive data sets, we're collecting massive data sets. We've got a massive telescope array happening in Australia, the square kilometre array. That's going to uh, create so much data that we have to funnel some of it out during the process of capturing it. So we're going to be using machine intelligence to understand that data set. So the processes in psychology and neuroscience feed into this. Um, accelerated science, um, there's economic incentives. Now, I mean, the first person to come up with like a, a reasonably intelligent, maybe 10-year-old uh, style general intelligence is likely going to be able to make a lot of money, okay? And, um, but there will also be accelerators. There's things that could happen that will uh, cause the singularity even to never happen or just happen maybe um, very far into the future. Society collapsing could be one of those, okay? So there may be an end to Moore's Law. Now remember, Moore's Law, if I haven't already discussed it, is um, the accelerating progress in, in technology in general. It's, it's often used to, uh, it's often colloquially used to deter, like mean technology in general, but Moore's Law is literally the amount of transistors you can fit onto a seat. Um, doubling every 18 to, to every 18 months to two years. Okay, um, there could be a complete depletion of low-hanging fruit, and we can't develop a higher up ladder to get to the next stage. I can't see any evidence of, of that um, across the board. There may be some areas where it's very hard to make it past, but like um, across the board, there's always opportunities to make a technological change. Societal collapse if there's if global warming stops our um, progression because we lose the framework in which we have like we're scaffolding thousands and millions of scientists working on these problems. If that suddenly goes away, then it's going to be very hard 
uh, to make progress in, in, in science or technology. Uh, if there's a nuclear exchange, if there's a solar flare, there may be a disinformation. Maybe we'll decide, oh, these technologies are just so dangerous, we shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be actually developing these technologies. There's, that's a possibility. We can't be 100, if we can't, if it's not likely that we can develop the technology to um, have a safe future with the technology, then why would we continue developing it? Well, maybe if we were all one in mind and spirit, perhaps, but there will always be underground movements and, and competitive advances um, by different countries or different organisations who maybe uh, have like skunk works operations going on that might actually develop technologies in secret. So even if we decide as a culture to stop this from happening, there can be dissent. So how long can we affect, uh, the, how long before the singularity? How long um, is the likely estimates? Well, a lot of people say a lot of different things, and I think it's very hard to predict. But we can make predictions. Just because we don't know for sure, we can make, what, we can make estimates based on what we know. A lot, a lot of um, experts say that it could be in 100 years. Just within this century. Okay. So, in terms of how to think about um, the singularity, there's three concepts that I'm going to introduce you to. One is accelerating returns. The other is the idea of um, an event horizon. And the third is the idea of an intelligence explosion. We'll start with accelerating returns because that's goes well concept, and a lot of people know that. Um, so, accelerating to returns is very strongly coupled to the idea of Moore's law and technological progress over time. Okay, but the progress of technology um, that uses the previous pro uh, uh, progress of technology gets faster and faster. So technology plugs on technology, it creates faster and faster um, developments of technology, uh, and and. We wouldn't be able to move as fast ahead in developing faster and faster computers if we didn't first develop early forms of uh, computation and it's impossible. Um, so having more computer power does help, as I mentioned as, as one of the points in the accelerators. It 
doesn't, it's not actually the same that I want it to make. Okay? Um, I'll explain why. So, yeah, the, the idea that um, accelerating change should be thought of as a separate component, as a separate idea that, that may help increase the likelihood of a single variable. We'll say that by the way for the next repetition. Um, the next concept is the event horizon concept. How will we know what an intelligence that is both far greater than our own and may be architecturally very different from our own? <laughs> How do we know what we're thinking? It's a, it's a very hard problem. What can we do? I mean, like, we're at this stage. What would Vern Vinci says, who coined the term technological singularity, who I mentioned before, great side, by the way, he said that what would a goldfish, what would a goldfish know of Mozart? Can a goldfish appreciate the relevance of Mozart? Maybe. I don't know, I'm not a goldfish. Okay, so the idea is, um, if you have uh, super intelligence, how do you know what it's going to think? So we, we see this singular, this um, event horizon metaphor, in, uh, the singularity metaphor in maths and in physics. Um, it first started in maths, okay, and physics borrowed the concept from maths to say, okay, well, it's very hard to see beyond an event horizon. Now, does everybody understand that an event horizon is that part of that hole? where light is sucked in so fast that you can't actually see the light, right? You can't see what's going inside the black hole, okay? Um, and so we use this metaphor to try to help people understand that it may be very difficult, not impossible, but difficult to, to make predictions about what an AI may think if it gets to a certain level of intelligence that is far beyond our own, okay? It's difficult to make these predictions. There's another metaphor um, which I'll bring in, and that's the Hawking radiation idea, where um, particles that are, that are here, that like are, um, are strongly coupled, that's where I'm hitting, hitting. Um, so there, there's particles that are entangled um, in the universe, and an interaction with one particle can affect the state of the other particle, okay? So, if one of these particles escapes into the black hole, by watching uh, the particle that it's entangled with, he may be able to make predictions about what's going on in the black hole. Okay, that is, that's a metaphor to, understand, to help us think about, well, what can we do to make predictions about uh, our vastly super intelligence? We, I don't think uh, the game is lost. I think we can make predictions. That's my intuition. There's been a number of others who have suggested this. Nick Bostrom and Steve Ocampo believe this. Um, a, if it is, if, if a, a super intelligence gets to a state where it can um, self reason, then it may be able to make, uh, we may be able to make predictions about its behaviour. A, we might be able to make uh, predictions saying it will try and protect its resources. It might try and be able to self improve. It may um, want to um, optimize itself. There, there are a number of points that we can uh, we can make predictions about. But what 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 this is saying is we can we can assume as long as the artificial intelligence doesn't have the goal of trying to um, make itself more stupid or kill itself, then it will try to um, make itself more intelligent and more able to survive in the universe. So the third concept is the intelligence explosion. And this is what I really mean when I mean the technological situation. So, this is an awesome concept. It's very, it, it's, it's very tight in this definition. I think we need to be careful about how we define things. So, um, I, I suggest after this, after this uh, conference, you go back and, and do a little reading on the intelligence so it's a, feed, it's a feedback loop of minds being able to create smart minds. So it's the simplest expression that I can um, give us. But if there exists a mind that can make a smart mind, if we can, we're minds, we can make a smart mind, then that smart mind with its extra intelligence may be able to make an even smarter world of mind. Okay, so this is a feedback process. Slow repeat. It happens over and over again. And 
this may result in a very intelligent uh, entity, okay? Because it can happen very quickly. Um, I, I guess one thing to note in here in trying to make predictions about how fast a singularity might happen or the fast, the rapid change that may result in a singularity is that we don't currently understand how our brains work. We don't currently understand how our minds work. And AI may be able to, like, this is the black box, okay? And it's also constrained in its resources. And AI may be able to understand, have a blueprint of how it works. So if the AI understands completely how it works, um, it may be able to optimize areas of its operation. So if you have a, like, if you have a, if you have a code base for a compiler, um, you may be able to look at that compiler and understand what's going on and make it more efficient. You may be able to optimize that compiler so it makes it even better. You can, you can compile it better programs or drive the software drivers. Sometimes you get driver updates for your software, right? If you, you've got peripheral devices and you, you can upgrade the drivers because uh, that helps the, the GPU work better and helps graphics run faster and, and stop problems from happening. This, this is sort of similar. Um, in concept, that an AI, if it's got a code base, be able to understand itself and then would be able to recursively correct itself and with the more intelligence and optimization and computing power that it gets from doing so, would be able to think of better ways to do that in smaller periods of time. That's a very powerful concept. Um, yeah. And I think that that's, that's the core thesis behind the technology. So, so in, 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 in retrospect, we don't need accelerating progress to have a singularity. Um, it, like the singularity doesn't include the idea that you can't predict what's happening beyond the singularity. Have we almost finished in time? Okay, so we'll just start to wrap up. What time is it? Okay, so I've got 15 minutes. I'll start, I'll start at 11. We, we started like much earlier. Yeah, and, okay. Yeah, so you, you, you've actually gone I know. more than the yeah. amount of, of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. that in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so anyway, um, I'll wrap up now. So the idea is that if we have um, artificial intelligence that can self improve, we, we should really be thinking about how we create that artificial intelligence in advance, and not just assume that everything will be okay. Um, we need to guide this process carefully, um, and we need the greatest minds to work on this problem, we need the war minds. And we need China to help solve this problem. There's so many smart people in China. Um, and, and when you think of like the sort of resources that are going into uh, developing better forms of lipstick or uh, the sort of finance that's going into sort of working out how to advertise that alone, that, you know, so more men will buy it. The amount of finance or research money going into these sorts of is hardly anything at all. So anyway, um, I'll just leave it there. I thank you very much for your time, and um, I'll hand you over to the next speaker. We have James. James, you want to come up and plug in and get ready? So we have you next.